this is going to serve as the notes for your chapter 8 over earthquakes. Some of the things that we talked about last chapter um, were forces that cause earthquakes and the types of boundaries that um, you would have with an earthquake. Um, remember, with the types of forces that cause earthquakes, um, we talked about convection currents. And the types of plate boundaries that we talked about were divergent boundaries, convergent boundaries, and uh, transform boundaries. This question is, can you pull the rubber band with any force and have it return to its original shape? Well, if you pull it too hard, it probably will break, right? At some point, every material has its own limit to force it can handle. That is the same thing as an elastic limit, the force needed to cause a material to break or deform. There are many things that cause earthquakes. One of them is the plate tectonics that we've talked about before, and convection currents, the circulations going on underneath the crust. Definition of an earthquake is the vibration caused by the crust breaking. So if plates do move, of course the crust will break. And we will feel those effects from those breaks. A break in the crust is called a fault. There are many types of faults. One of them is called a normal fault. A normal fault is where plates are diverging or the plates are pulling apart. The um, forces involved with that would be a tension force. An example of a place on Earth that has a normal fault is the Sierra Nevadas. Another type of fault would be the reverse fault, uh, where plates are converging or coming together. Um, the forces involved there are compression, like squeezing the plates together. An example of that would be the Rocky Mountains, how those formed. Strike-slip faults are at transform boundaries, and that is when uh, the plates are sliding past each other. Uh, they call that a shear force, a shear force. So um, an example of that would be a place like the San Andreas Fault in California. Uh, remember, with strike-slip faults, they're just sliding past each other, uh, so there is no vertical motion with that kind of fault. Uh, there's a lot of snagging and pressure that exists from a strike-slip fault, so there's a lot of earthquakes that occur on those. There's a lot of destruction that happens with an earthquake. The amount of destruction depends on several things. One of them is the distance to the epicenter. The epicenter is uh, a place where uh, the energy is released for the earthquake, where the motion is happening. Sometimes the rock and soil types affect the amount of destruction going on too. If the rock is softer or the soil is softer, it will cause it to move a lot more with the shaking. Building types depend on, or affect the destruction too because if a building isn't built sturdy, it will fall apart easier during an earthquake. Um, I will be giving you a wave diagram later to look at for the parts of a wave. Here are some vocabulary words for this chapter that will be important for you. Um, usually things with uh, earthquakes start with the, the beginning of the word is size, like seismic wave, seismograph, seismograph station, and seismogram, like are right here. A seismic wave is an earthquake wave, and they usually move outward from the place where that movement occurs, and they call that the focus. A seismograph is the type of instrument that measures earthquakes. A seismograph station would be where they have all those instruments stored and where they do that work. And a seismogram would be the paper just coming out of that machine. 
there are different seismograph uh, stations located around the United States and they use those to determine where the epicenter is of an earthquake, where the earthquake began. Some other vocabulary terms that are important for this section are focus is the place where the energy is released for an earthquake. If you would look directly above the focus, that would be the epicenter. And usually they mention that in the news because they talk about uh, a place on the surface where that earthquake began. A tsunami can result from an earthquake because um, like if, if the earthquake happened on the ocean floor, the bottom of the ocean would shift and it would cause the crust movements on underneath the ocean water and then all that ocean water would come in. Some of those tsunamis end up being 30 meters high at the shore, which are really, really devastating. There are different types of seismic waves. Uh, one is called the primary wave. That's the first jolt you will feel in an earthquake and they're very fast. They're two times as fast as the next type of wave which is called a secondary wave. Secondary wave uh, moves, they say, at right angles to the P wave which is the primary wave. Uh, so they kind of move side to side and they can't travel through liquid very easily. A surface wave is a wave that moves back and forth or kind of in a circular motion, an elliptical motion. And these are the type that cause the most destruction. But what you're going to feel first is the P wave, uh, that jolt, and then you'll feel side to side motion, which is secondary waves. And then finally you'll feel surface waves, which are the circular motions, the very destructive kind. Uh, what do the changes in speed and direction of the waves indicate? Well, um, if you measure earthquake waves and look at those recorded measurements, sometimes you can tell the change in the density or the thickness of the layers of the earth. So you could tell whether a layer of the earth was solid, liquid, or gas. A focus can be near or far from the surface, so it's important to look at the waves and what they are showing you, and sometimes that focus could be deep beneath the earth, and so that could be good information to learn. You can also estimate the distance from the epicenter by using the speeds of seismic waves, and that can determine where the earthquake started. Seismic waves and the earth's interior um, the inner core is supposed to be made mostly of iron and nickel and a solid. The outer core is more liquid-like but still made of those same uh, materials. The mantle uh, has these sorts of elements in it, um, silicon, oxygen, magnesium, and iron. And these symbols are symbols for those elements that you would get from like the periodic table. The area right between the mantle and the crust sometimes is called the moho. And there is something called the moho discontinuity discontinu uh, because waves have a tendency to speed up when they enter the lithosphere or the crust. So you can see that on the wave information you get from um, seismograph uh, readings. There are areas within our layers of the earth that are considered to be in the shadow zone where no waves are detected. So there could be areas where would not receive any kind of damage from an earthquake and that's called the shadow zone. Um, in the upper mantle and lower mantle waves uh, speeds can differ so um, by looking at those readings you can tell what's going on with the layers of the earth. There are a couple different types of measurement systems that you can use to measure earthquakes. Um, one is called the Richter scale. This is the most common scale. The Richter scale measures the surface wave effects and it is using powers of 10. Uh, and what you do to figure out the Richter scale is you look at how much movement happened. You change that movement into a power of 10, like 10 to the x power. And then whatever that exponent is, 
you add 3 to it, and that ends up being your Richter scale reading. And we will practice doing this later on in an assignment uh, in our chapter. It has 10 levels. There are uh, 10 is the highest level on the Richter scale, the most powerful level. Another type of scale is called the Mercalli scale. And this is based on your observation and it uses the effects you feel and see from an earthquake. It has 12 levels. There are some things that uh, you can do to help your safety in an earthquake. I'm going to just list a few out for you. If you know how risky it is to live in your area, uh, that's good to know. If you have uh, heavy objects on shelves, it's best to put them on the lower shelves to kind of stabilize a shelf. Uh, sometimes people will secure their hot water heaters and furniture and appliances down. They'll actually fasten them down. Um, it's good to keep away from windows and watch for fire hazards. Um, to use better building materials like steel and rubber framework that's like stronger and a little bit more flexible is a good idea. To have very deep foundations for buildings stabilizes them. And if an earthquake did happen in your area, you want to stay clear from the rubble um, and uh, fire hazards. Put sensors on gas lines that will shut off. That's a, a good idea uh, if you live in an earthquake prone area so that that would reduce your chance of fires. And uh, having flexible pipes and gas lines, that's something some people are doing now as they're building in an area. It is a good idea to avoid things like bricks and chimneys in an area that has earthquakes because those tend to break and crumble during an earthquake. And to avoid concrete unless you reinforce the concrete with some sort of steel rods. Uh, build on a sturdy uh, surface or soil and rock because the softer it is, the more it will move during an earthquake. And wood is a good material to use. Uh, it's flexible and strong, so wood is still a good material um, in an earthquake area. Okay, that's your notes for this section. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know, but uh, that would be it for earthquakes.